also, um, where did Patty go? Oh, I wanted to uh, first tell you we have two re two reporters here. One of uh, the Dowdens, uh, Mike Dowden, will be videoing, and Cheryl Dowden will be writing an article. So those are those that are not here today will get the information sent out from me. Um, Patty McDonald, who's been a 40 plus resident on Cortez Lake, wrote a little synopsis, historical synopsis for y'all just to have some background. And we're going to open a meeting up with Patty briefly giving some information and then I'll turn it over to Ken. Okay. okay. You see why I'm not saying I'm going to come on today for Dave and uh, Gabby Spann. Uh, and Dave is the archivist for this plan. He's got every clipping, every news article of any kind, and the table that supports his speeches. Kathy uh, has organized it. It's a, it's a notebook that needs to be. So I've been going through that. They could not be here today because of family responsibilities. But um, I have been going through that and I've hit the high points. I've missed some uh, things that were very important, but I'm sure to all of us or to some of us. But this is the big overview of what I was going to tell you. So please read and take with you today. Take an extra copy and give it to a neighbor. This this might be the down. So I appreciate your coming out. Thank you. And, and our director, Mr. Unger. Yes. Okay. For the of the South. Thank you, Patty. We're going to start this with Q and A. A lot of you wrote questions down that I'll read we can answer. And then there are some that want to be able to stand up and, and talk. And, and so at some point, you guys have to do. All right, I'm turning it over to this Ken Unger. For those of you who don't know, he's the director of public utilities. Anything else? Public oh, services. Public utilities and public services. In a broad range of areas. So thank you. Take some time. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. So uh, before we get started on this particular issue, I just want to give you a little background on these so, so you know what you know what you have here. So uh, I bought a home in the village in 2012, um, retired here in 2015, and as part of uh, you know the zine change when uh, certain individuals left, uh, I offered my services to come back and, and try to help uh, resolve the issue across the POA. That were within this this realm of responsibility, which covers everything from common property to roads to water to sewer to uh, you know pretty much everything except recreation and golf is under the umbrella of public services. So um, I've been here in this position a little bit over a year. I started at the beginning of May last year. Um, and how many of you uh, have known about these issues that have been going on on the lake? Okay. So I found out about these issues uh, November 16th of 2022, okay? So just to give you a little history on what I'm aware of here, because again, some of you may have more knowledge than I do even about what, what occurred on here is, you know, we have a major trunk line that serves the entire west, western part of the village uh, that, that runs along Lake DeSoto and Lake Cortez that hits the Cortez pump station, which I think you call San Stistabon, some of you referenced, which then in turn pumps to the Mill Creek sewage plant. So one of my efforts here is to uh, deal with the aging infrastructure. And uh, when, when I took this position, we knew that the Mill Creek uh, plant was about 50 years old. So it was built in the 70s. It was a packaged plant, which means it was you know, kind of a prefab system. It was meant for more smaller entities, not a, a large community. Um, and basically most of the elements at that, in that plant are it's useful in the bluff. Um, so there were some plans in place to do some upgrades there. And during heavy rainfalls, uh, that plant overflows. And every time it overflows, we report that to DEQ. We're required to report those overflows. So we were working, we've been working on plans to help remediate that. Um, and, and I can go into those in a little bit of detail, uh, as well. 
But the uh, when this issue came up, which was unbeknownst to me, um, we, we dove in immediately to start looking at it. And what I found out was that there was various efforts throughout the years to try to address this. The most recent one was about a $800,000 project to uh, elevate the rims of, of the manholes uh, in the west side of the village, not specifically on Lake Cortez per se, but, but basically throughout the village. And while that had some improvement uh, in, in the situations that were going on, uh, which I'll describe to you, uh, it, it did not solve the problem. Um, also, when I got here, uh, the pumps on the Cortez lift station were in the process of being replaced. So those pumps, I don't know how old they were. God knows they were probably 50 years old for all I know. Uh, but those were in the process of being replaced. So the problem we have on the west side of the village is, outside of the date of the plant that's old, is that we have what they call I-9 going on in the system. So we are a combination of uh, infiltration that gets into the lines from below the surface, and we have inflow that gets into the lines from the surface. And again, the effort to raise manholes probably helped on some of the inflow issues in the village, uh, but a lot of them probably did, Frank. Uh, if it wasn't in the low-lying area to begin with, there was probably no real water getting into that manhole. It did not address the issue of leaking manholes or leaking lines underneath the ground. And what I think it's important to realize is the line damage, and, and frankly, this came to light again, why? because I think Lori or somebody saw our contract and working on repairs on the major line that we contracted at the end of last year or early this year after we were done doing the work we did. So in, in the cases of where the lines and manholes are damaged, what's happening there is infiltration is getting into the lines. The pressure from water outside of the, the lines and manholes is actually getting into the system. Nothing's really getting out in those instances unless that line is exposed um, we did find one that, that we uh, could, have, could have gotten out. We, we, we basically replaced that line with cast iron plate. Uh, but for the most part, these are situations where uh, infiltration is getting into the line. And, and I'll explain where that causes problems in a second. I'll give you some of those examples. And these are in the one minutes. So, you know, this isn't something that's new. Uh, I've been reporting this to the board. Uh, frankly, the board didn't know any of this either, by the way. At least the ones I talked to did not know this was going on. <laughs> So that was uh, news to them as well as to me and Kelly. Uh, but we found, for example, a, uh, a pipe for one of the docks when we were right through the middle of the 24 inch sewer line prior to the Cortez Moose Station. Uh, we fixed that immediately. Uh, we found a uh, situation where uh, a cable provider had bored through the top of the 21 or 24 inch line, 21 inch line, and left a huge six foot, six foot long gash wide open on top of the pipe. Now again, there's rocks and stuff around that, so it's not like anything's flowing out. That allows water to get in. Uh, we found multiple other issues. There's those line repairs, which are cracks in the seams, which we basically just had repaired, three of them, for about $60,000 uh, uh, on two on DeSoto, one on Cortez. And we've had seven manholes that are leaking, that were leaking repairs so far today as well. So this is all since November of last year, since we've come in. The other thing that we did that uh, you know that we think has made a difference is we did raise some of the manholes further in the areas that were overflowing. So 28 Ruby Circle, and I heard you say, is that is that your address? Mr. Yeah. yeah. So we put some extensions on some of these low-lying manholes. And the problem is we can't design something if we don't have quantitative values on what's happening in the system. So our efforts over the last six months have been to isolate where the overflows occur so that we can actually get measurements. And one of the other things that we did to allow that to happen is we cleaned all the lines on DeSoto and Cortez all the way from Palela lift station over to the uh, Cortez lift station. And when I tell you there was a lot of stuff in that lines that shouldn't have been there, uh, those lines were flowing more than half full with everything that was in those lines. And, probably, and right now they're probably flowing about a couple inches deep. Because it's not a capacity issue on the system under normal conditions. It has to do with inflow and infiltration that's causing the problem. And the lack of maintenance on the line itself which we took care of uh, late last year and early this year. So what happened when we did that? Well, more flow started getting to the plant. We had less overflows, but more flow started getting to the plant. We had more overflows at the plant, which is expected. And that's what we want. If we're going to overflow anywhere, we want to overflow at the plant so that we can build plans around that and, and stop. Um, you know, we're not 100% on the system yet. Um, and I'll tell you some of the things we're looking at. Uh, but I will say this, and uh, I'm not, 
and you know, maybe you can confirm, but in the May 11th event, uh, we did have overflows at the location where we're monitoring now and we're measuring flows, but I don't believe it overflowed at your property. First time ever. Right. And it did not overflow in any other location outside of where we are allowing it so we can measure the amount of overflow so we can design the handbook. Okay. So that's an, an optimistic front. So the, the two things that we're doing, hopefully, that will, you know, solve the line issues. And, and when I say solve it, I'm, I'm going to caveat that for a second. But when they replaced the pumps at Cortez lift station, all they did was replace them in time. So if those pumps were designed to handle X amount of gallons per minute, they put in the same type of pump to handle that amount of flow. Well, we have an opportunity there because the line, because the line, oops, oh, sorry, the line that runs from the Cortez lift station to the Mill Creek plant can handle a lot more flow. So we're in the process right now of having the, the pumps re-engineered to see if we can put pumps that are twice the size in there which will allow us to leave the level of flow in the system lower because it pumps what's coming in at the same rate that's coming in. That'll further hopefully decrease the chance of an, of an overflow in the system. There may be one or two other areas where we uh, raise a manhole that we see it on the lower end, but for the most part, the rest of our efforts here are gonna be focused on the equipment at the lift station and stopping the I&I &I where we can find it. So quickly. Can you have you looked at lining the existing pipes? <laughs> yeah, so that's what we did on these three point repairs, right? There were three weeks at joints. We put a liner in there from the for upstream manhole. They, they, they drove a liner in there about six foot long to stop that leak that's occurring. And they'll do video of that to show. Actually, they did do video of it, and they're going to come back within a year and do a follow up video to make sure that it worked. You know, at this point, and, and I think what you're talking about is a more comprehensive reline of the system. Right? That's not going to solve a problem that doesn't exist if those lines aren't leaking. So we're not doing that yet. We, we want to invest our money in the things that are going to solve the problem sooner than later. Um, and again, you know, it's important to point out, while this doesn't directly affect you, it affects all of us, is that as we direct more flow to the Mill Creek plant, we're going to be overflowing more there. So we're going to be investing money in the Mill Creek plant to uh, build more what they call flow equalization basins to hold more of the overflow. Um, and then we're actually looking at bypassing that plant and sending all flow to Cedar Creek and only using that plant to store overflow that happens. And there's some dollars and cents reasons why that's a better solution. A lot of communities do that because the cost to actually repair I and I sometimes outweighs the cost to contain it and then process it later. So right now we're, you know, again, those three point repairs, just an example, each one of those was about $20,000 a piece. So, you know, you can imagine how that adds up. Manhole repairs are roughly $2,000 a piece. So over the course of the rest of this year, just to give you some idea of what we spent, you know, we had an I and I budget last year of 150,000. That went totally to the lines on DeSoto and Cortez. Um, we upgraded the Cortez pumps, as I told you, for about $122,000. And we're going to be investing probably another quarter of a million to get those pumps upsized. Um, and we have a $400,000 budget this year that we're investing almost entirely in the Cortez area. Now, we do have overflows on the east side, just so you're not alone. Uh, but they're not as severe or impactful, you know, to, in my opinion, as what's happening here, which is why we're investing most of our money here. Uh, but we do have lift stations that overflow for the same type of reasons on the east side of the village as well, right? So, uh, in a nutshell, you know, what I'll tell you is, Again, I took this job to, you know, and I'm a civil engineer, my math grant. I was a director of Verizon over uh, massive construction across the country and network operations on different types of things. And, you know, my hope is to, uh, to employ my skills and my support for these guys that, you know, need it in order to do what's required to get us to, you know, where we should be versus where we've been. And a lot of this is that infrastructure increase that we talked about. I mean, we may need to spend even more than that for bonding and stuff, but you know, the dollars that we are paying in assessments increases is definitely going toward infrastructure. And, and you know, I can show you the numbers to prove it. Uh, my budget right now is uh, almost $4 million to upgrade water and sewer across the village. So with that, I'll open it up to any questions that anybody might have. And just do raise your hands, just bear with me, and we'll go over the time. I got some. What was the place? Uh, they were officially put in service early this year. So December and January time frame. And you put in the same size pumps? Correct. Now, but that thing was increased reliability. 
So the clocks that were in the Cortex substation, and that's, you know, there's a, there's a nuance there that I think is important. Some of the overflows that probably happened in this system early on, some of the ones that you've experienced, were probably due to pump failures. So when that happens, now you're talking more sewage. You know, when, when those pumps are working and pumping, you know, solidly through, most of what you get is, is stormwater that's coming into the system. So it's not as bad as if those pumps fail. Um, but yeah, so basically what they did was they, they put the same equivalent size pumps in for the pumps that were there that weren't working well. And we did see a little uplift with that, but, but I think we can do better because we have a 16 inch line that goes between that lift station and the plant that allows us to pump a lot more uh, flow out of that lift station. Which keeps the elevation down. Now you're going to have to increase the size of the pumps. Yes, and we'll use those pumps somewhere else. We have a couple of lift stations in the village. That, uh, we have 56 active or 57 active lift stations in the village. So uh, we have at least one that, that mirrors this Cortez lift station, and they're probably at least in need of one pump repair, if not, if not both. So here you go. That way, people can hear the question. Do you want me to repeat it, or do you want no. to? No. While the sample numbers were below danger zone numbers, there was a fairly high variance. Do you have any ideas as to why the areas near the boat ramp were so much higher? Well, and you, you may not like this answer, but, you know, if you walk over there, there's a lot of geese crap in the air. And, and that does affect the pilot, the E-Pole line. And we did a two series of tests. We did E-Pole line, which is more tied to uh, geese. And we did overall fecal tests that, that it comprises anything related to what would come out of the uh, sewer lines. And, and all of those tests, again, there's a lot of things that can cause variation in those. The key is for lights, anything below 125 is, is good. And for our sewer discharge, anything below 200 is good. So, you know, they're a little more stringent on the lights, but you're going to get variations of that in, in different parts of the lake because of, you know, well, they're not things like these. Said something about anything under 200 or over 200. Yeah, so talking about, I'm talking about a sewer treatment plant. But you're not talking about sewage in the plant. You're not talking about stuff that's measured in the plant. No, I'm just talking about the readings. The, the readings of people in E. coli. I understand that. Yeah. But we could have E. coli in the lake, right? You could have levels of it in the lake, yeah, all, at all times. Where does the 200 come in? That's back at your sewage treatment plant. What's that? Where does the 200 come from? Yeah, that's back at the discharge of the treatment plant. The discharge and at the treatment plant into the middle fork of Saline River. Yep. Uh, how about in the lake? 125. So we're we're under 125. Oh yeah. Every test was I think the highest was 86. The lowest was four or five. Does that include the test from yesterday? Wasn't there one like three days out Tuesday? Is that the test you're talking about? We took about? them all roughly at the same time. Uh, we, we had to wait for the results. The, the first tests on E. coli, we sent out to a certified lab. Uh, the ones for people we did at the treatment plants, which we test for uh, every week. Uh, so, you know, they came in. I had the tests for uh, people probably a couple hours before I got the test back on E. coli from when I sent them out immediately to, to Lori. So. Yeah. The grapevine has it that there are a number of sewage leaks into Lake Cortez. We have smelled sewage as we have bone in the lake. Do you have an of leaks on equipment malfunctions? Please share it with us. So I'll go back and, and reiterate. The, the line issues that we had, that we repaired, there's nothing getting out. The pressure of the water, specifically from the lake, a lot of the, the, the repairs and the TV we did, we did while the lake was down, so that the amount of water pressure around the pipes was reduced. Um, so the, the, when you talk about breaks in the line, even that huge gash I showed you, there's not sewer coming out, there's water going in. And that's, that's the problem, because during heavy rains, the pipes are already inundated with water, and that's where you get the backups that, that you've experienced. Which, so we don't have situations where there's sewage leaking into the lake. And I want to make that clear. And that, and that, you know, and, and I'll take a little umbrage to, you know, I may or apologize again for my response to the smell in the lakes, but you know, I swung in Lake Cortez for the last 10 years. I swung with my grandson. You've all swung in Lake Cortez or had your friends in Lake Cortez over the years. Like, there haven't been any problem, right? Do you have any, have any problems that they're aware of that they don't have to report to us? And again, I mean, we can talk about what we want to do to resolve your concern, but you know, my, my impression is when, when a topic like this comes up, 
you know, things that we, you know, uh, use normal now become red flags because we think all of a sudden there's sewage in the lake. And that's, that's not the case. If you look at the test results, we don't have sewage in the lake. Now, I'll say that, that, you know, maybe we'll take a closer look because maybe there's something leaking over there that's not related to this. Maybe there's something over there that's not related to this. Or you mentioned your sample at the top of the water down. The they usually sample at elbow level into the lake. I mean, I watched him sample. He was about a couple inches below the water uh, behind the locations that we gave him. Uh, the people in the lake are taken from a boat, so they're coming off the back, and usually they tell you to take it down a little deep. Um, but yeah, so we don't have any equipment malfunctions at this point, and we don't have anything actively leaking into the lake. We have water getting into the system that's causing problems when we have rain events. And thankfully, again, if you heard it from him, and he's been experiencing overflows because that's he's, he's how I found out about this. If he didn't get overflowed on May 11th, that's a darn good sign. Yeah. <laughs> Believe me, that was that was a almost a cataclysmic. Uh, I almost uh, invoked the disaster recovery plan for the village in that uh, as I was sitting in my uh, public service meeting getting hammered by the phone bins. The edge of the sewage lines go under the water. Yes, there are sewage lines that run under the coves. For example, the one where we pull the boat dock uh, post, there's a line that runs under that cove prior to the Cortez lift station, and we do follow the Santa Esteban lift station. Well, how do you know that under the water this is not leaking? Okay. So we, we invested $150,000 for them to clean the entire line from the manhole upstream, and they sent a hammer in there and videotaped the entire line. And the areas that are leaking, this water getting in, uh, we fixed the three, three to, uh, over the last week, I guess. And the 1970s technology. I mean, these are what, white plastic? Or no, no, I mean, I think that line is ACP. Yeah. This is concrete. It's concrete. This is concrete. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's a joint every so on. Correct. And when they take, send that camera down, they rotate it around in each joint and look to see if there's any leaks. That's how we found the three that we repair. And they put a 21 inch sleeve in two of them and 24 inch sleeve in the other. Did you stop going in anywhere in plastic? When we put new lines in, yes. We use SDR 21 or yeah. SDR 21 TVC. Yep. Okay, so I have a question. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, Sandy, 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 Sandy. I think so. Okay. So for my simple the boat piling, I mean, the deck, dock piling went into uh, Ruby Lane, number two. That was one of the things. Ruby Place, number two. That had, had a hole in it. Since 2005. Right. How, how did the sewage not get out of that? Well, I think if you look at where how the pipe was lodged in there, I mean, it was jammed right through it, and, and it was basically the size of the hole. Mm -hmm. I, think I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't yeah. cracked open. Well, I have a picture of it. Yeah, I, I posted yeah. pictures of it. Okay. Just see. I mean, I, I stop. There, and there, and there might have been. I mean, I'm, you know, I mean, if you look at the pipe, the pipe is, if the pipe is underground under the lake. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. not, it's not floating in the lake. It, it was under dirt. So uh -huh. there's something all around the pipe, even if it's cracked. And again, when you talk about it being in the lake, and I'm just giving you my list of, you know, you have a hydrostatic pressure from the water that's pushing into that pipe. The pipe itself is not grabbing, is grabbing. So it's not pressurized. So you're, you're getting pressure pushing into the pipe, not stuff coming out. Now, that, the exception to that is, we, and we, I think it was a gravity line we found that was, was actually cracked in the top. Yes. And you replace that line that's crossing a cove and it had been cracked by some rocks or something else that, that hit it. And we replaced that line, which was above ground in the cove. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The Heller contractor told several residents on Ruby Circle that the new pump ordered for the San Francisco pump station was the incorrect pump and doesn't work. So when it rains or sanitary sewer overflows into the light, why hasn't this been fixed? Did I answer that already? Yes. Okay. What? So it's not like they so so look, I mean it, it's easy to say that they were the wrong pumps. They were the wrong pumps because the problem wasn't really understood. They were the same pumps capacity as the pumps that were there. So, you know, when you're talking about uh, a generic operations group that's trying to improve what's there, you know, they, they're not going to go out and try to re-engineer something uh, for, for no reason that they're not aware of. And, and that's where, you know, I, I'd like to think 
you know, my civil, civil engineering background uh, kind of helps in this because I'm not just looking at what's there and what was built. I'm looking at what we can do with what we have. And what I mean by that is, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the systems in the village, for example, the lift stations, um, the new truck bays, they were built for the full build out of the village. So on the east side, that could be, you know, uh, 17,000 volts. But we don't have that on the east, the east or west side of the village, right? We have about, you know, 9,500 homes in the village. So the lines themselves have a lot of capacity, in it, which is true probably for the pumps, given what they are designed for. But they're not designed for heavy infiltration like we're experiencing today. So this is kind of a, a new look at it saying, look, we have a line downstream that has more capacity. Can we upgrade the pumps to push more through them? And the answer from our engineers is yes, you can. So that's what we're going to do. But when you're in the field and all you're doing is saying, I got to replace this pump because it's broken or it's, it's decaying, you basically just do that and you get what you get. And, and frankly, we've seen improvements with those new pumps. Frankly, the reliability is improved because those other pumps were breaking down. So we have seen improvements from that. And it's just not uh, as much as I think we can get if we upsize them to handle more flow to match the flow that's coming in. Okay. That makes sense. Mark Kent, I think he just answered your question. He asked about reliability. Uh, List station. I worked at uh, Exxon Mobil for 35 years. I'm a pump designer. I was okay. uh, head of electrical instrumentation section. I know my, no, I know what I'm servicing. I'm and uh, uh, question about the reliability of pumps. I, I, I've been on a lake for 10 years, and I've seen them not work, as you said. And I've seen your remote start thing. One of the things we had at the refinery for critical pumps, um, which such as this, I consider a DEQ incident critical, um, sure. was we have critical operation guidelines, which we, we call them COGS. We had to do COGS all the time throughout the refinery on critical pumps that existed. Yeah. I could certainly consider this. And what we would do is we temporarily run a pump mm -hmm. uh, in and let it substitute for the other pump in and so we could have a good current standby pump. I was wondering if you have any pods that you run on the pumps. Yeah, so the question is, do we have basically operational pumps to, uh, yeah, to apply to get the pumps to make sure that they're working properly, right? That's basically what you're asking. I'm asking if you have them and what the frequency are. Yeah, so the, the answer is, is generally no. So if you've, if you've read anything that I've put into the uh, digest or uh, Village Voice or in Cheryl's uh, uh, website. Uh, you know, this is called the, I, I deem this the year of operations for Hot Springs Village. And uh, part of that is establishing methods and procedures on, on how we do stuff. So, for example, you know, and, and, and again, we have to have a, a measured balance here. You know, for example, we have thousands of water valves in the village. We should be exercising them technically. We and can't exercise them. We don't have the resources, right? Now, if you wanted to pay $300 a month, I could go out and hire a bunch of people to do that. Pump on, pump off. Well, so we do, you know, and I'm not saying they shouldn't have regular PMs, but, but we got to remember, we're still working on resolving issues, right? So, so you know, the, the, the struggle that we've had here is that yeah. most of these poor guys and gals are responding to disasters. Not, and I just had this, uh, and just to give you an example of what we're doing there, we created a new organization last year called Plant Maintenance. So their job, right, once we get stuff replaced and, and working is to ensure that they are touched on a regular basis, cycle, loop, whatever's required to keep those things, you know, running smooth. But it's a process, you know, if stuff hasn't been looked at and, and been able to dealt, dealt with for years here because of a lack of funding or a lack of focus, whatever you want to say, you know, the first thing we have to do is get things up and running. And I'll go a step further. You know, the first step is to get the pumps that are down, flat out, replaced. Not even to mention whether or not pumps that are working are working properly. Right? That's another level, level of depth here. So you have two new pumps. Right? If there's two new pumps. And they have failed at all? Nope. Nope. Now, again, their, their capacity is limited. And what we're, you know, basically, in a nutshell, what this comes down to is, you know, it's the level of, of fluid in the list station. Right, so the pumps we have, that level gets to a certain height. And that height is higher, in some cases, than the heights of the manholes in the system. And that's a problem. So what we've been trying to do, again, isolate it in the system, which I think we have, 
And the next step is put larger pumps in so we maintain the level of flow below the lowest manhole out in the system. If we do that, then we're good. But let me caveat that. I want to caveat that because I don't think I think I, I need to. Oh. I just had one thing to say. Those pumps alternate. Could you never the flow with water? So, this is Fritz Fuzal. He's the superintendent or water steward to the village. He owns all of us. Okay. The, the pumps alternate back and forth, and they are flow monitored at the Wake Farm treatment plant, and they are watched daily to make sure they're both putting out the same amount day after day. Yeah, somebody going down there daily? Watch them? Is that what you said? I think I said they, they alternate back and forth from one to the other. And at the wastewater treatment plant, the flow is monitored to make sure they're both putting out the same amount of flow. They automatically switch. They automatically switch. So yep. if they're both being monitored all the time, and we do go over there a couple times a week and make sure that there's not another issue. And, and Chris raises a good point. So you know, one of the things that we've been working on is the implementation of a, a, a comprehensive scan system, uh, which is remote control. Uh, of, of the system and, and monitoring the system remotely. So, you know, Cortez Lift Station is one of the ones that, that has its own SCADA capable. So, we have remote monitoring capabilities of that, of that location. So, but what I wanted to say is everything that I'm talking about doing here, even if it's successful, doesn't necessarily guarantee we're not going to have an event, right? Because there could be a catastrophic event that occurs that causes a problem. And you know, to the extent, and regardless of what we're able to do or should do for DEQ standards. So the, the key here is that, you know, and then this was based on my opinion, was that what was happening here during normal rain events was unacceptable, right? So that had to be taken care of. And if we can handle, like I said, what happened on May 11th, we should be in pretty good shape for most other events that happen. But again, if something cataclysmic happens, and I'll tell you, like, even from a, a standpoint, one of the things we invested in last year was a portable backup generator and a bypass pump. So we have capabilities that we didn't have before. Now, Cortez has its own generator, but if that fails and power goes out, we could have a problem, right? So now we have a portable generator. We've invested, I think, what, $80,000 in each one of those uh, last year as part of the infrastructure spending. So we're in a much better position operationally than we've been in a long time here. And our hope is as we continue through the year of operations, we'll continue to develop the processes, procedures, documenting those things, and moving more toward maintenance versus just responding to disasters. Fair enough. I have I have a question first. Where's it? Is it on paper? Oh, no, it's not on paper. Uh, sorry. Um, I'm just I, I'm one of the residents of property owners um, that spoke to the Helen group that and sewer and cleaning up the sewer people. And I'm just curious, why would that why would they tell me that there is sewer leading into our lake from the San Cristobal lift, Cortez lift? Two, two different people. Told that too. I have no idea. I mean, it's not, you know, we, we had to clean it out. We had to clean the lift station out. Right. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure, I'm not sure who told you that. Um, the crew of the No, I mean, specifically, I mean, we can. <laughs> don't give that. Don't give I'm that. not. Well, I mean, we know who's working out there. It's not, uh, right. but, right. you know, there's, there's no sewage flowing into the, the, the lake from the lift station. I mean, we, we tested it over there. I mean, I tested the, tested the right to water. So your testing has been done under the best weather conditions, eight to ten days with no rain. Would you be willing to retest all the so-called bass spots after a heavy rain? Sure, we can do additional testing. I mean, I'll have my guys come out and take the samples, and we'll, uh, you know, and actually, I hope we do get some rain. Yeah. What are the plans for Ruby Circle, 28 Ruby Circle? Well, the plan is to stop it from overflowing. That's the plan. So we don't have any other, uh, right now, we don't have any other uh, slated work on Ruby Circle. Uh, we are gonna probably do uh, some uh, work to evaluate the individual manholes along those lines. In order to do that, we have to basically plug up the line flowing into the manhole to see if there's inflow coming in. Uh, we did identify two manholes during that repair process that have water coming in from the bottom uh, that Helen's going to repair there. Um, and we'll probably enact something along the rest of those manholes to have them plug it, check, and if they're if they're leaking, if water coming in, we'll we'll plug them uh, as part of their scope. Yeah, uh, property owner at Twenty Eight Group Circle. Yes. Yeah. Tim, this is Tim. 
has Thank you very much. much uh, yeah, other than the 28 Ruby Circle, my wife and I, uh, hopefully some of you guys have uh, seen the emails I've sent. Uh, I just, first of all, I want to I want to thank Ken, and because uh, we, we've been living there now, it's been 14 years, 2009 is when we bought the home, and the uh, sewer hole there, just to give you briefly, I think Ken's done a great job of explaining things, and uh, honestly, I, I, I don't have a whole lot to add of what I would do different than what he's doing right now. This is the only time it's been, up until now, nothing's particular. <laughs> okay, and we've dealt with a lot of different people in management because we know how the POA goes. They, these are elected people and they change over time. And so I'm pretty pleased with what's going on right now. But just the super quick history of it, you're welcome to go back to the emails I've sent. As it, but we moved in. Uh, um, there were plants all around the sewer. We never even knew it was there. And uh, within maybe a week or two, we uh, went outside in our backyard and we smelled sewage. And we're like, what the heck's going on? And so we, we thought it was the grinder. So I mean, we couldn't figure this thing out because it was hidden in the bushes. Well, it didn't take long before some yard maintenance and whatnot that we found this, this, this sewer hole. And a long story short out of that is every major rain, big time rain that we're talking, that sewer overflowed. We reported it, you know, dozens and dozens of times to different people in the POA and all that. And due to resources and, and, and money and, and what, what they, I mean, they can only do so much. We understand. And, uh, but it, 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 has got, it has gotten recently to the point where we're about to retire here full time that I was really starting to get upset about this. Uh, it's up because over the years of the different things that they had done, uh, uh, to try to make changes and put in new pumps, and that's all stuff in the, in the past. None of it worked. And uh, so, we have, you know, we're talking three to four times a year. We, our backyard is just full of sewage. And every time it happens, the yard is unusable for a month because that's how bad it smells in our backyard. Our, our neighbors here uh, used to take pictures and the, everybody's done everything they can do that we can do to fix this. Uh, and so most recently, maybe three months ago, I sent an email to everybody that I have an email for, uh, which I obviously missed them. I know they've changed over the years, maybe 150 people. And I sent it to every member of the board of directors not a single response. I got one response from somebody here uh, that said, you know, we feel for you, keep up the good work. I, I, I just have to get it, you know. So this is awesome that we finally have people here because I've been screaming this forever. It is you know, nice that he has a band that we've got a problem. I have the fortunate or unfortunate to have the lowest point apparently on the slide. 28 Ruby Circle is the magic low spot. Not anymore. Not anymore. And so I noticed about a month and a half ago, I live in Little Rock. We spent every weekend in the village and have forever. But as long as we can get here most of the time. And I, about a month and a half, I came and I looked at the backyard, which is a disaster right now because we're having a new seawall built that was knocked down by sewage. And that's another long story. I noticed that. Uh, there was a rim now, but it's raised up for the uh, sewer entry. And I told my wife, I'm like, has that been like that? She's like, no, that's, that's definitely good. So they've raised it up. Well, then we had this massive rain uh, on the 11th, which has got to be the worst storm that I've seen here in probably the last eight to 10 years, because our water was all the way up to about 10 feet from our home. So the sewer and all that was completely covered, but as the water retreated, it did not overflow. And you would know because it would smell. I mean, a hundred percent, I can tell you, it did not overflow. That's the first time that a storm of that level did not overflow our system. Now, I can't tell you if that has now pushed it somewhere else or what's going to happen, but I think Ken's plan of monitoring this of dealing with the issues, and I think we all need to keep looking for when you see these issues and let them know. I mean, they're obviously trying to help us. I mean, we know it's a problem. Uh, it's happened. I can tell you, at least from my experience, which has absolutely been the choke point for the last 
13 years, it's no longer the tipping point because that storm would have done it. And so, anyway, I want to thank you. Uh, you know, I know we've got a long road to keep going, but we're walking the road, right? right. So I'm happy with that. Yeah. Uh, and it's the 16 inches and my overflow into the lake, the water came up and leaked the water and it just kept flowing out. So if mine overflowed, how did yours not? Oh, what, what was the date for that, Debbie? It was May 11th. Okay. So I'll let you in. I'm not an engineer take care of that. And I, 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 I did kind of visualize this but like an air mattress, you know, that's in the lake and you got like 10 holes and you stick your finger on one and now the next one shoots out. It's, I would imagine it's going to be that until they fix them all. Yeah. So I heard this also, Dan. I mean, we've yeah. moved upstream a little bit. Yeah. And again, you know, to this point, right, all these sewer manholes have different elevations, right? So uh, our goal is to get it to one location, not some of these backyards so we can actually measure. If you have a situation occur, we need to know about it. Because we can't, we can't tell, you know, we're not, we can't go out to all the manholes to, to know during the event. You see something, you need to report it to me. You did? Yes, I know. Okay. I sent you information. Oh, May 11th? Right up, right I, mean, up. I said it was May 11th, but it's very, yeah. yeah. I mean, during the event or? Yeah, we have to get checked. Yeah. yeah. How, I mean, I may have it. If you send me an email, I have it. So I'll, I'll go back and look at 22 Ruby Circle. Okay. Yeah, so our goal there is, again, to try to get it to at least one location, hopefully only one location where we're monitoring the amount of overflow so that we can put the pump sizes in at Cortez. And we're going to probably max them out to whatever we can get on that 16-inch line. So it's going to be what it is. But, you know, from what our engineers have told us, it should increase the ability to pump a lot more water through that line from an inch. So we keep the level in the lift station down below the levels of the manholes. And in your case, we may need to raise you another six inches or a foot. So, so, hold on. So, overflow, that bird, is that getting that sewer coming out? I mean, there's some sewer in it, okay. but it's predominantly storm water that's getting into the system that's causing it to surcharge and, and blow out. Yeah. We, we can't hear you from that. That's the problem I am having with this whole thing. It's now that water, now rain flow, runoffs, normal storm, normal storm sewer type stuff. Gets into a sanitary pit. So, well, let me give you some examples of how that happened. It's, it's a lot more common than you think. Well, I so we have, we have, you have find it to the rich. Did you guys have, have this conversation when, when we're already in the house and talk to him? You've got a lot of questions people. Well, okay. I mean, I can give it to you. I can some simple example. You know, we, we have uh, manholes that are in between townhouse buildings that basically are rotted out, and water just all the water flows between those buildings, flows right into the system and gets. Sent into the sanitary system. What's that? No, not all. It could be uh, lines leaking, right? So underground infiltration, as water starts to percolate through the soil, it starts penetrating the lines and starts. And we're we have a couple lines right now. We're going to go TV that are upstream of these 21, 18 inch lines that we're going to have to dig up probably and replace because inflows getting into them underneath the ground. Has the POA requested federal infrastructure dollars to address our aging sewer issues? If so, what outcome? Well, that's a great question. You know, as a as a private gated community, we get zero. We qualify for zero in federal and state aid. Now I say that as as uh, based on on submissions that the POA has done in the past. Um, last year. I submitted for $32 million of what they call American Rescue Plan funds. Uh, and we were fortunate enough to convince the county, Salem County, to submit on our behalf for infrastructure in Salem County. Uh, we did not get the same cooperation from Garland County to submit on our behalf. Um, but even there, uh, we did not get a nickel funding assigned to us. And that would have been matching funds. So if we had gotten 15 million, we would have invested 15 million and that would be $30 million worth of projects. Uh, so the, the short of it is, uh, no, we don't get federal funds. We basically don't really qualify for state funds unless we have a, a, an entity supporting it. Now we're looking at ways to maybe change that uh, down the road, but 
we don't have anything solid there yet. With the money saved on the incomplete dredging of late of the late 500k, what is the status of that funding since it was allocated to the lake? Can you please be used for the pump upgrade? Well, uh, I'm not sure what incomplete means, but we can talk about that later. But uh, we did not budget that money this year because of the change in the approach that we took to dredging. So we didn't allocate, you know, 700,000 or a million dollars to dredge uh, Lake Cortez. We allocated about 200 and uh, maybe it was a little less than 192 plus 25. So a little over 200,000 to do what we did on Lake Cortez. Uh, while we did come under there, Unfortunately, we also had somebody run into the uh, outfall gate of uh, Lake Isabella, I believe, and we had spent 32,000 fixing that. Uh, and then we also had a couple of landslides that we, had, we, you know, we didn't plan for, so we had to you know, invest money in those. So we wouldn't have extra money in there. But that's irrelevant to the spending on the pumps. I think I already answered that question in that we're, we're in the design phase right now, and I'm gonna find the money to, to upgrade those pumps. So, from somewhere. How many SSO occur per year on an annual basis on average? Can we have the last five to 10 years of each time you reported to AEQ regarding? Uh, the answer is he's got the folder of SSOs that we've reported. Last year, I mean this year. And I've left it. So, you, so I don't know what the number is there, but uh, we can give that to you. Regarding I and I, what efforts have been made to reduce infiltration? I think I answered that. Yeah, you answered that. Like that. Does the Cortez pump station have the capacity required to handle our sewage volume? The answer is yes. It does have the capacity to handle our sewage volume. That's not the problem. Yeah. The problem is the water getting in the sewer is not supposed to get in. Um, where does the state and EPA stand on this long occurring problem? Well, I will tell you that I'm planning to, we, we've been submitting SSOs on the, uh, on every, every overflow that we're aware of. Again, if, if we're not aware of it, uh, we, we aren't even reported, but everything that we're aware of and reported, we have not heard back from the state. I expect that we will. And we're actually setting up a meeting. I'm going to be setting up a meeting next month with them to kind of review the overall proposals that are in place for the Mill Creek plan, which will include, you know, what we're doing to ensure that the system upstream of the plant is, is stable and able to, you know, support what we have coming into it. because. You know, if you can't get rid of the I and I, you need to actually be able to handle it. I mean, that's what they're going to tell us. So that's what we're, that's what we're playing. Thinks the I and I have to process less water and plant. Yeah, and, and you know, I get you, right? It sounds like that's the easy thing to do. The problem is, you know, uh, and I'll just give an example. I mean, it, it could cost, uh, you know, a million dollars to replace, you know, uh, a mile of line. Okay, and that only is going to fix, you know, a hundred thousand gallons of, of water infiltration. If I spend that million dollars on a on an overflow basin that can handle a million or two million gallons, it's more economical to do that than it is to fix those lines. I mean, you know, I haven't calculated the total infrastructure cost, but how many of you lived here for 30, 40 years? You lived here a long time? You know, I mean, I've got a pretty good deal, even those of us who lived here 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, because the, the money that we've been paying has not been enough to cover the depreciation of the infrastructure in the village. And I've said this publicly, and, I, and Kelly has as well. We have at least 50 to $100 million worth of infrastructure if we were to replace it in kind, in the ground, the way it is today. Maybe more. I don't even know. I haven't fully tapped it. But, you know, the goal here is to solve the problems as efficiently as possible so that we borrow as best, at least as we need to, to meet state permanent requirements and to, to do the right thing so that we don't have, you know, lines overflowing on a regular basis. But we have this issue on the water side, too. You know, and, and you know, like I said, I have a lot of uh, hats that I wear here, and and you know, to me, sewer is very important. Water is even more. Important. So everything we do, you know, on the water side has to be 100% uh, what what needs to happen. And we've invested a lot there too over the last year since I've been here, and we'll and we'll this year as well. The solar high tide systems are on some manholes. Yeah, they're they're useless. <laughs> I mean, the reality is it's useless. I, I don't, I'm not sure, I mean, he's not even sure why they were on there. I mean, you know, once it overflows and, you know, if, if, if everything's working properly, now the alarm should be at the list station, right? 
I mean, knowing that the levels rising in manhole is, if it, at best, it's optics, in my opinion. I mean, so rather than having to look at them, we took them off. <laughs> it's leaving your yard today. Yeah, I saw it. They took it today. Yes. They put this. That question, have y'all seen these things they put on top of them? Well, so, you know, I'm, okay, well, I've already got a big round pit in my backyard, which, you know, is ugly. And then we got this huge thing that was on top of it that was supposed to report. Something I didn't know. That's I'm, I'm water levels, but yeah, I'm, tell you, I'm not sure what that does for you. No. So they took it out while I was over there. To Wait a minute. It was only a call to someone that didn't work all the time. Yeah. Well, if it didn't work, I'm happy to see it gone because it's a nice sore. So. Is Lake Cortez water routinely tested so for what, when, and by whom? Please provide us reports. The answer is no. It's not routinely tested. Um, we routinely test the uh, the uh, beaches as required by the state prior to the holidays. But I will tell you, as I related in, in one email to Lisa, you know, I thought I've been talking to the lakes uh, team uh, earlier this year about putting a comprehensive lake testing program together. Uh, I don't know what that looks like yet, um, but I think you know if, uh, one of the requests is to test after a rainfall event is probably not a bad idea that we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll implement. Um, and, and see see what those look like. But even outside of that, you know, my hope is that we'll have something that's on a regular basis yearly that we'll be able to provide in all the lakes, not just like Cortez uh, throughout the village. What did the POA finally do to meet the ADEQ requirements for copper and phosphorus content in the effluent from the sewage treatment plants? I'll have to defer to this guy because that was, I think, taken care of prior to the meeting. On the, on the copper, we found a chemical that precipitated out into our sludge. And we now meet that requirement by quite a bit. And on the phosphorus, we changed our flavonant, which also precipitates it out in, in our sludge. So we've done it chemically to take it out. So that's what we are doing, and we meet regulations every month now. We have been for the last three years, I believe. That is my question. That answer the question for May 11th. Does you monitor the tomb San Sistapon area at the San Sistapon and Parliament at the intersection because it did overflow during that this time frame? So we we have a manhole that has a measuring device on it that we're monitoring. Um, and again, we came out and checked 28, but if there's other locations that you know of, and I'll look back to my emails to, to look at 22 Ruby, um, and, and if we know we had an overflow, and I'm not, you know, I'm not surprised, uh, to be honest with you, you know, I mean, if you look at, like, the storm drain systems, they basically got overwhelmed uh, by what happened. They lost multiple roads that day, I had multiple landslides that day. Uh, people that lived on the lakes, you know, not here, but in, in some of the other lakes, their homes were just about flooded uh, because the lake levels rose up <laughs> to the doorstep. So, you know, um, but I'm not aware that of what you mean by the Sintisticon and Parmonic intersection. That one here? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Like the oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, so, that, that, that's, so basically what we try to do is we try to isolate it to that location. We're actually measuring it when it happens. And, and, and thankfully, on May 11th, we got great measurements out of that. So that helps our engineers now determine what whether or not the pump up raise will actually work. Uh, the, the, the last study that we have with that little brick that you put on top that yeah. the teacher tube yep. But it was overflowing that and through uh, the side on it. I, I have pictures of that. We went out there and looked at it. Uh -huh. And the engineer and I went out and looked at it. And we took pictures of it. So we're, we're working on that. But so basically what we have in here is a metering device? So we can actually measure how much flow is coming out the system so we can make sure that the pumps that go in can handle all of the flow. There's another one that I spotted um, the day after the wild was raining on May 11th, headed towards um, the Dog Park Lachi Ball area on the right hand side. You know, the flow goes over the bridge and down into where it comes into Cortez. There was another one that was just Surprise. Right. We didn't know something. Yeah, that that was really bad. Yeah, and, and you know, I'll, I'll say this to anybody. Uh, if you see overflows, you know, reporting to us via our website, 
Well, Paul, I confirm the website so we have a record of it. But how many of you know about my website? The Lakes Committee website? No, no, the Public Services Committee, Public Services website. All right, I'm going to do the chief pitch for this because I think it's a good way to communicate my organization. So we introduced last year, if you go to services, you know, services on the, on the members portal, and you go to the bottom, public services, that's my website. And on there, there's a pull down menu uh, of all the services under public services and, 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 and categories to report issues. So if there's a sanitary sewer issue, you can report it there. And, and the reason I advocate that versus calling is because when you submit that, you get an email back, you're required to put your email in there, you get an email back, and then that email goes to uh, my admins, the superintendent over that area, and myself. And, uh, you know, we, we are generally able to respond a lot quicker uh, getting those emails rather than having a call transfer from person to person or note, handwritten notes transfer. So uh, if you haven't looked at it, I encourage you to do it. Submit a test question if you want, and I'll, I'll respond back to you. Is the link being tested for pharmaceuticals? No. I'm not really sure what we would test for pharmaceuticals. I guess we could talk to the testing Agency, but did you did you write that question? Oh, yeah, yeah. I brought that question up because uh, it plays into the idea of we ought to have a comprehensive testing system. Can you introduce yourself? Oh, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I don't know who I am. <laughs> My name is George Maxey. I'm a uh, PhD in uh, environmental science and environmental geology. So got a little bit of background in understanding how the lakes work. Uh, just to give you an example, north side of the lake, south side of the lake, there's different, different geology underlying the lake, which actually contributes to different mineralogy to the lake policies. Hold on a minute. <laughs> Is that Paul on you? Uh, okay, he's wanting to tell us. And our company opens. They're having to battle the empty old commercial dumpsters. Well, I've never done anything like that. Yeah, I spent more time on trash than anything else. Okay. Is that better? Maybe. 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 The water chemistry of the luminology and the lake is extremely important. You know, here in the village, uh, age population wise, the oldest and the youngest are the primary users of the lake waters. So the waters of the lake need to be properly monitored uh, to give us a good look at uh, you know, the cleanliness of the lake. So I, I posed that question because I've worked on a project in Texas where. Uh, sewage was leaking into uh, one of the lakes and it was actually because of the pills that we older people take and I'm, not, I'm sure there's maybe one or two of you in here but uh, that ends up into the sewage treatment plant and eventually some of that can leak into the lakes and the result uh, we found that uh, in this particular lake we were monitoring the fish were being feminized by uh, the chemistry from uh, what people are consuming. And of course, it passes through your body and goes into the sewage system. So uh, I pose that question because I think every single lake in the village needs a proper uh, monitoring, whatever group of tests. Have you ever tested the lake for any? As a PhD, have you done any testing for concerned about pharmaceutical? Not in this like you've not done. Anything. Yeah, I'm having pets. Do you go in the lake? Pardon? Do you do you go in the lake? No. no. I'm not saying it's unsafe. I just don't. <laughs> just curious. Just yeah. don't. <laughs> yeah. um, actually, you know, neighbors will ask me, and I'll say, yeah, it's in the middle of the lake, stay away from the edges. Uh, the water chemistry, the, the life, the aquatic organisms, the bacteria, the viruses, the amoeba, everything else that's in this lake 
uh, there's concentrations depending on where you are in the lake, and that varies depending on water temperature or the amount of nutrients coming into the lake, how much phosphates are coming in, if there are uh, a host of other uh, chemicals coming into the lake. So when I was on the lakes committee for five years, I proposed this, and it went absolutely nowhere. Uh, you know, I even gave a big list of things that we should monitor for every single lake. I think it's important, and uh, pharmaceuticals are just one of them. Water treatment facilities do not have the capability to deal with pharmaceuticals in the water. We're the initial source here, and as a result, this uh, this lake is pretty clean. Did you hear what he just said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sampling. <laughs> so what I'll, what I'll commit to uh, Maxie, and, and, and if you have a list you want to send me, I mean, I, you know, obviously everything we do that we can't do ourselves cost money. And I don't know what a broad spectrum test, uh, you know, costs to test every lake in the village. But I agree with you. Every, every lake in the, in the village should be tested for the basic things, right? Yeah. And that's what I, I said earlier. We we're actually going to be working on. So, we do, um, and, you know, as far as pharmaceuticals, you know, uh, hopefully they're good ones. That's all I can say. <laughs> but uh, if you think there's one that's a serious issue, you can test for another one. I have about 10, 10, 15 minutes left here, so I'll try to read through these pretty quick. I've heard that there are only three POA employees who work in lakes. How many people work at golf courses? Uh, that's true. There's only three uh, lakes people under me and, and, and a superintendent, so technically four, but he's got common properties and and uh, mowing and, and a bunch of other things. So Todd's a, Todd, if you know Todd, he doesn't know Todd. Um, he's a busy individual. So yeah, we have, we only have three people. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, the, the uh, thing we have to wrap our heads around is you uh, aren't going to get uh, five-star service at two-star prices. That's kind of my new, my, my new slogan. When you move here, we go, we move here because it's economical. Uh, you know, I, I only have 80 people for my entire organization for everything. Uh, and it's a long list of stuff. So we're trying to be as efficient. I think our lakes team does an outstanding job. Uh, they're, they're, in, they're on top of every issue that, that I'm aware of. Um, and you know, as far as how many people golf pies, I, I, I couldn't really tell you. Uh, but they're probably the second biggest organization uh, in the village. During the 2010 uh, uh, under phosphorus and copper in the F1, Mike Michigan like President stated the lakes are as valuable as our golf courses. I wonder why the statement was even necessary. But I would love to hear our board president say the same today. Is that still the POI board's position? I couldn't tell you, but it's it's my position. I mean, I view everything in the village is as critical, and that's why I took this job. Well, sorry. Any explanation as to the difference in water clarity now as compared to last year? Now, brown tint at my location versus crystal clear a year ago. I mean, I'm not a biologist. I will tell you that two of our three lakes people are biologists. And I, I think I said that in my email. I wasn't trying to be demeaning. All I was trying to be, you know, give you some level of uh, confidence that we're not just hiring people off the street. We have, you know, two people that, that know lake. And Katie's been here almost 10 years now. So she's, you know, pretty intimate familiar with the lakes. But what I do know is there's a lot of factors, and maybe Max can speak to that, that affect the call of, you know, clarity of lake. Uh, we do have people on each lake that I think take samples that, 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 that produce for the lakes committee, uh, clarity and some other factors on the lake. You may have done that actually on Cortez, right? Um, so Yeah, we don't have one right now. I think Captain Duty was the one who was on Come on now. We had almost Seriously? four feet of rain yeah. from January 1st through May 11th. With four feet of rain, we're going to get a lot of particulate, a lot of runoff, whether it's sewage based or just runoff. That's what you're seeing. That's why the lake is cloudier than it was last year. That will precipitate down and, yeah, and it'll I, become clear again. And you know, silt, silt has been a big issue, right? It's one of the things I'm trying to tackle here at Village. And we've done some, you know, we have to be careful there. You know, the Village got in trouble doing the Gavion some years ago uh, that required on the poor approval, and they, they didn't have it in time. So, you know, we've reached out and we've been kind of working with, you know, within the confines of what we can do. But part of our goal there is to try to stop effluent, you know, effluent stopping uh, silt from getting into the lakes to use the check dams upstream. 
that's not going to help a man level. And we all have to repeat thinner. So the ones that we did have in place for lower level rainfall is basically they were overwhelming. Now we're going to put this one together. They can't repair it as long as you take it all out. So hang on here. The POA's remediation plan seems to focus largely on increased pumping capacity and or increased processing capacity, but the sewer overflows that account after heavy rainstorm suggest that stormwater drainage flowing into the sewer lines is one of the primary causes of our sewer line overflows. Are there stormwater drains in the village that are intentionally connected to sewer lines? Uh, my guess is yes, from people's houses. Um, or yeah. drying tanks that are sitting below grade because people don't want to see them, so they, they kind of bury them. In uh, with landscaping, not unlike what we're saying, but you know, and we see that there uh, is I and I getting into those those tanks, like the ones I told you between the townhouse units. And we're we're actively working to fix those. Don't don't get me wrong. I'm not we're not stopping trying to fix the I and I. It's just at some point, the cost to do that is way more than the benefit than handling it in a storage type of approach. And a lot of places do. And Tulsa has my engineer was telling me you do have new engineers by the way for what it's worth. So. You know, some of the advice we may have gotten in the past maybe wasn't the greatest, and we have uh, a new engineer that's that's working that I have a lot of confidence in. But Tulsa has like four of these storage bases throughout the city where they, during overflows, this stuff goes and sits until they can pump it back in this uh, drainage system. Um, if not, what is the deal? We're doing trying to eliminate stormwater from getting into sewer lines. We have an active program. Uh, the plan is to invest four to five hundred thousand dollars a year on the upfront side to fix I nine, and it's predominantly on the west side of the village. Um, that that work's going to happen. So, if the PLA is currently trying to find and eliminate the source of stormwater getting into the sewer lines, what, if anything, can homeowners do to assist the PLA in finding the source of the storm drains getting into the sewer lines? How many people read my ask pen about providing letting us know if your drying tank or pump is running during rainfall? Uh, you know, or looking for, uh, you know, areas where water's getting into your, your sewer line. If you see something, it's overflow, you see a broken pipe, uh, and we have a lot of people that use that treehouse system to let us know, you know. So if you do smell something, you know, we'll come out and check it out and you see if we. But we have found stuff from from people reporting. Keep in mind, you know, as Kelly likes to say, this is like a co-op. You know, I have limited resources, so I can't have everybody out there just looking at things. They're out there responding to things that, that need to get fixed. So as a community, if you see something, use my email system. Send me an email. Like I said, I get them day and night, and I respond to them. If I don't, my people do. Um, so. And last but not least, ask questions on fish type and kill. Well, that's, that's me. Again, I'll put it on my fishing pad. Uh -huh. uh, I, I've personally pulled out two carp and three bluegill out of the lake. Um, I've heard the answer was, you know, fish relocation. Um, I just wanted to know if you're having this problem at other lakes. And I also uh, wanted to point out that the carp, of course, you know, is a bottom Feeder. Yeah. And uh, bluegill is an opportunity feeder, which means he'll go after the minnows, which I haven't seen from my house down there yeah. hardly at all. And they, otherwise, they're going to feed off the uh, vegetation off the bottom. So uh, that's why I asked you the question, how far deep did you go into the water sure. when you when you did your testing? I'm, I'm just concerned about the fish that we are seeing, what type they are, and do we have something... Well, we know that there's a some sewage at the bottom of the lake. It has to be, you know. Yeah. And dilution is the solution, right? You know. Yeah. You know. You can happening. have this lake the size and dump a lot of sewage in there. I'm just asking about: Are you concerned about the fish, and were we having that problem somewhere else? You know, I don't know if you know, but we shot from um, every lake. We shot every lake uh, to do fish sampling, right? So. My, my sense is, is that some of the fish kill that we're seeing is, is tied to that. You know, some of the fish don't survive. Oh, you think it was part of the shock in the spring? Uh, it's possible. Yeah. Who knows? I mean, it wasn't that long ago that we just did the shock. It was probably a month ago. I think it was after yeah. the May 11th, wasn't it? No, I think it was just before that that we did it. Lori, I'm, I'm waiting fish for have you seen the response, you know, to your email? How many fish have you think out there that yeah, don't survive? Many, many. Okay. Again, multitudes, and that's at first. Since I, I don't think this is efficient. This is a yeah. lot of fish. Yeah. Yeah. And different times. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's possible we, we lowered the lake. You know, uh, we had it lowered for quite some time. There could have been a lot of fishing stress because of that. We couldn't 
Did it survive? Carp's a pretty darn hard fish. Was that? Yeah. Carp is a pretty darn well, fish. You know, argument to you is, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to Katie about keeping her eye on what's going on here. It doesn't settle out, and you know, we'll, we'll look into it more, more deeply. Maybe we'll do a biopsy of the fish and see if there's anything in there. Really you know, I've never done one, but you know, maybe that's I'll something. say one for you. Take five and pull something. I have not had that. Uh, I live in Jacksonville, and I have seen uh, at least eight or ten targets okay, floating by. Okay. Numerous, numerous of uh, handbits. You know, you know, it's uh, unfortunate whether it's a mackerel die off. Uh, I, 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 yeah, I, don't, I don't know, but I'll admit to you is I'll, I'll talk to Katie about it. Um, you know, have her investigate more what might be happening here with, with the fish and see if it's tied to any of the activities. I've done a lot yeah, of activities. The UOA office? She's over at the Cortez uh, uh, Indians. I'll just bring the fish up to the office and let me move it over there. Yeah. As long as they're edible, I'll take it. <laughs> hey, I'm not worried. Right. All right, take it kind of off. But one, one for you. Since you know all the results of the water once it's cleaned and everything, do you personally drink out the tap here or do you use the filter? I've worked at Clark Camp for five years. I drink straight out of the water. No. Four? Yeah. Four years. Okay. Yeah. Four years. I drank out of the Clark bottle. When I first started working there, I used the well water. So, so I, I drink out of the tap. I don't put my house now. My wife used to put what's recommended from the village. The numbers show that's fine. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah obviously. But you know, yeah, my, my <laughs> wife uses a burpee because of um, oh, he's, he's saying he worked at the water plant and yeah, he drinks out of tap. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I know based on what I you know, we actually had a plant inspection not that long ago, and the guy, the guy from the state told us that you know, we had what some of the cleanest water he's ever seen. So, the only you know, I, I drink out of tap at the POA building out of my house. Uh, I did out of my own house on the lake. Uh, my wife uses the Berkeley because she doesn't want fluoride. That's the only you know, reason she does it, to filter fluoride out yeah, because she doesn't want fluoride. Right. Uh, when we need to report a location to you that's like specific to a sewer top or, you know, or a fish in this, do you use a particular app or GPS coordinates or what do you, what's your department use? Well, we have a GIS system where okay. you know, if you give us coordinates, we can we can map it uh -huh. uh, to that to that exact spot. Yeah, uh, we're doing some stuff like that right now for for boating and stuff. But uh, you know, generally a, a street address. You know, if we you know if it's if it's manual related or lake, we'll find it when we go out to that general address. So it's okay. kind of, you know. I'll recommend one to you then. That's called What Three Words. Uh -huh. It's the name of it, and it's used around the world, and it's used by ambulance services. Uh, and, and that app, everybody, you can get it on your phone. It doesn't cost anything. Okay. And what it has done is they uh, map the entire planet to 10, 10 foot squares. And those 10 foot squares have a name. So you could pull up this pavilion and you could you can pull up this seat and you click on it and it gives you three words. And it's a lot easier. Departments use it. Rather than giving you some crazy coordinates that are 10 digits long, yeah, you know, you're like, so this is like, you know, chair, pillow, blanket. And that, and when you put that in that app, it will show you this 10 foot square. And you can actually submit a picture on my website to me. Okay. So you can take a snapshot of it and that's boring or so whatever. Right. You can submit that JPEG yeah. through, through our website. But I just wanted to bring it up because it's, um, some of these manholes you've got are up in the woods and everything sure. else. And to tell you where it is, yeah, that's the, the, closest that road, do it. the closest road gets it to us. But yeah, we have a better way to do it. I'm all about it. And look, you know, uh, I have to actually hit the road here for another meeting. But you know, in everything I've ever published, uh, my name, my phone number, my email address is on it. Uh, if anybody has a question, you can send me a question. I'll do the best of my ability to answer it. And if it's an issue, I encourage you to use the website and the forum so you have a record of it. As opposed to things getting lost in the in the communication chain, um, and we will do our darndest to get back to you as quickly as possible. Ken, okay, I'd like to say uh, thank you for the last couple of years. Um, I've spent ten years on this lake, not as many as a lot of people, but I've seen more done in this last two years. I'm I'm watching the people outside. I'm talking to the people in the truck and everything. I'm I'm watching the pumps being replaced, and I I have to say. 
uh, thank you for you, what you've done in the last couple of years and, and getting things rolling on the fixing this. You can't do it all at once. Yeah, I'll tell you this, you know, none of this happens without people like Chris and, and all the people that have been here in the way. You know, what we, we can do is support them in, in, in helping to fix the things that they know need to be fixed, but we're never supported to do that either because of financial reasons or whatever it is they did. So, no, I appreciate all you guys, uh, and, and I want to just finally say I, I take this issue seriously, like all the other issues that I'm dealing with in the village, and I'm going to give it my all. Uh, but wait, I'm working more than 40 hours a week on, on this job to resolve these things as quickly as possible so I can go back to playing golf someday. So, <laughs> yeah, we're frustrated. Yeah, gotcha. So thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, I will post or e blast to all the uh, website, the public service website, and you'll have it. Thank you, Laura. Great. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Thank you.